The Committee on Parole is called back to order. Uh, our next case is Mr. Norman Dozier. Mr. Dozier, if you would please give us your full name and DOC number. Yes, sir. My name is Norman F. Dozier, Jr. My DOC number is 387320. Mr. Dozier, I'd like to explain our process to you. Uh, first, I'm going to read some information into the record, and the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, uh, we will allow those persons who've indicated they wish to have input to speak at that time. Uh, those persons who are uh, here to speak on your behalf, Mr. Kerry Myers with the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, also here but not speaking, uh, or Elise Arts. Your fiance, Ronald Olivier, a friend, and Justin Singleton, a friend. Uh, additionally, we have uh, <coughs> Bridget Dozier, Norman Dozier, and also in opposition, uh, we have speaking today Mr. Brian Greenwood, who is the grandson of the victim. Uh, Ms. Nell Wilson uh, Albright, Albritton, who is uh, also here in person, and Robin Maru, Maru, you? I'm sorry if I've missed it. Maru, okay. Uh, I see where it ought to be Maru, but it's spelled a little differently on my sheet. So, okay, uh, Maru. Uh, in addition, we have uh, uh, present uh, but not speaking Claire Wilson, Marilyn Scallon. Melissa Guillory and Don Wilson. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, this is the matter of Norman F. Dozier, DOC, num DOC number 387320, date of birth August the 26th of 1971. It's classified as a first felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of August the 1st of 2021. So, uh, adjusted good time of July 18th of 2044. Full term date of January the 13th of 2095. He was originally sentenced to life imprisonment for second degree murder. That sentence was commuted uh, to 99 years uh, on October the 20th of 2022 with immediate parole eligibility. Mr. Dozier, does that sound all accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Dozier, your case was assigned to me, so I will begin uh, our interview process. Uh, Mr. Dozier, uh, how old are you, sir? I'm 51, sir. And how long, how, how long have you been in prison? Uh, 27 years and three months, sir. Tell me a little bit about your educational background, Mr. Dozier. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I graduated uh, from Peabody Magnet High School in Alexandria. Uh, and I did a little bit of college at LSUA in Alexandria. And how old were you at the time of this offense? I was 24 years old, sir. Tell me about Norman Dozier at 24 years old. What were you doing? Were you working? No, sir. I was in a, a horrible place, a, a place of darkness. And I was selling drugs, sir. Were you using drugs? Uh, sir, I used to smoke weed periodically, and I uh, would take Vicodins every now and then. And uh, when did you start smoking weed? Uh, probably at the, about the age of 16. How about alcohol? Did you drink? Yes, periodically, sir. And when you say periodically, how often? Uh, a lot of times on weekends or any type of celebrations. Do drugs or alcohol play any part in this crime? I would have to say yes, sir. Tell me how. Uh, uh, the influences, I don't want to sound religious, but the influences are demonic and they bring you in a darker place even that, that you're in. 
And that's what one of the things that brought me in a darker place using those type of substances at that age. Were you using drugs on these this particular day? Uh, not at that particular day, sir. We, we, how often were you smoking weed during this period of time? Uh, not at that particular time, but when I was younger. So you're saying the effects of the the drugs early on had something to do with this, but you weren't on drugs at that time? No, sir. How often were you using drugs during that time? When was the last time you had used any drugs before this killer? Uh, maybe probably the weekend prior, probably uh, drunk some because I used to drink periodically, so probably a weekend before that. So tell me, tell me what happened. Explain to me in your own words. I and mean, we've got police reports. We've got all of that. I want to see. I want you to tell me what it is that you did, what your role was, and what happened. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for asking, sir. Um, on the uh, night of January the 10th, 1996, a co-defendant owed me money and I orchestrated a robbery. Uh, and as the co-defendant co told me uh, uh, what needed to be done, I let I the co say co-defendant owed you money. Who owed you the money? Thank you, Coco. All right. That's the woman who was involved in this. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Then what happened? And at that time, she mentioned that uh, I would need to uh, cohort with her in a robbery. And I let her know that I wasn't going to do that. However, I knew somebody that would. And I... Uh, so you weren't willing to commit the robbery, but you were willing to get someone else to commit the robbery on your behalf. Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. Okay, and uh, we left the house that we were at and we got the guy. Uh, Let me stop you for a little bit. What, tell me your reason. Why were you not willing to do it, but you were willing to let someone else do it? I, I would have to say, looking at hindsight, cowardly. I would have to say that, sir. Okay, go ahead. Continue. What happened next? Okay, we then we left to go get uh, the guy, my other co-defendant, and I shared with him as I began to uh, uh, formulate the robbery, and we all got in the truck and we went on January the tenth to Mr. Clarence Roban's house. And Vicky Coco went in the house uh, and knocked on the door. And uh, my other co-defendant went in also. And uh, what took place took place. The man was murdered and it was- Not armed with anything? No, sir. We didn't have anything on us. Uh, but my co-defendant looked in the back of the truck and saw a, a four-way jack. So at least one of you armed yourself with a four-way lug wrench jack to when you went inside the place. Yes, sir. Obviously to be used if necessary to get whatever it is y'all were trying to get. Yes, sir. Continue. Okay, and um, as my co-defendant went right, Vicky Coco went left, and my co-defendant stayed in the house for probably about 20 seconds and came running out with Vicky Coco, and we got back in the truck, and we went back to Marksville, Louisiana. And I would have to take full responsibility, sir, because had I not uh, got my other co-defendant, this would have never happened. You have learned what happened to the victim in this case. He was brutally murdered, wasn't he? Yes, sir. How did you learn that? When did you figure that out? I figured that out when the, the newspaper 
and the uh, the news came on that he was br brutally murdered. So what did you do after y'all left there? Where did you go? We went to Marksville, Louisiana, uh, to the house of Ray Brackens. Uh, I think on Martin Luther King Street, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't someone send Miss Coco back in, get money and to get some items uh, out of the house? Uh, not as my recollect. I can't recollect that she went back to the house. Did y'all steal anything? No, sir. So as far as you know, it was just a murder and no one got anything as a result of your going there to rob. Yes, sir. But to my recollection, no, nothing was taken. And how did you get ultimately caught? On January the 13th, uh, me and my fiance, and my, uh, which is my son right here, he was two years old, he's 30 right now. But we were at our house and uh, the Alexander police officers, uh, task force came to the house. And they arrested me and uh, they brought me back where they brought me to Red Peace Parish Jail. And then from there, they brought me to Marksville Jail. 19, January the 13th, 1996. You go to trial? Did you plead guilty? No, sir. I went to trial, uh, but I, I we uh, went to court. I didn't plead guilty. I got found guilty of second degree murder. As you look back on what you did, what motivated you to you say you, you you weren't drinking or you weren't on drugs or anything. What motivated you to get these several people to go over there and rob the victims? Mr. Marabella, I, all I can see, you know, as a pastor now, it's, it's, it's just pure evil. You know, I, I, I was uh, in a dark place. And my mindset was twisted, which caused me to make horrible decisions at that time. And I was just motivated by just being in darkness, sir. Let's talk a little bit about what you've accomplished while you've been in prison. Uh, what are some of the programs that you think have been the most helpful to you while you've been in prison? Um, Number one, I would have to say uh, the trauma class that I'm in right now, uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, uh, Warren Amble probably might have instituted it in, but it's taught by uh, Ronald Marshall and it's revolutionizing Angola. And it's showing uh, the trauma uh, that was caused and what also causes stress and causes all kind of other things to go on in you and how to release that and relieve that. So what what tell me tell me about how that's affected you. Oh it's, it's affected me uh, like this several ways, sir. Uh, one of the things that Ronald Marshall taught us in, 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 the, in this trauma class and teaching us is how to be a trauma-informed person, which they call TIP. And also ACEs, which is uh, adverse childhood experiences. We begin to learn our ACEs. We begin to understand how uh, those things that we grew up with affected us, and it causes us to be able to deal with that and begin to be better people. You indicated that that you you did drugs, or you drank a little bit, took some pills. Uh, have you taken any programs or anything uh, that you've been uh, while you've been in prison uh, that has given you some, some 
insight on uh, how to avoid that in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thanks for asking, Mr. Marabella. Uh, I've taught, I've, I've taken substance abuse uh, classes. I not only take it, I teach uh, Celebrate Recovery as a social mentor here in Angola, which is a substance abuse class. And I've also uh, been blessed by God's grace to create a, a curriculum called Recover by, Recovery by Grace, which is a substance abuse curriculum that God allowed me to create right here that we're teaching here and that several men here in Angola are being blessed and being set free from addiction. And I'm also a part of New Men's Ministry by uh, orchestrated by uh, Gar Gard Newman. Those are just a few of the things that I've done concerning uh, substance abuse. Tell me, tell me what you teach in that program. Tell me what what you're you're teaching to the other inmates, or what you're trying to instill in them. Okay, I'm I'm teaching it. First of all, my, the curriculum that I teach, Recovery by Grace, it's faith-based and, and it's uh, Christian orientated. And I, I make it known to them, you know, everybody's on drugs or in bondage and they're looking for a, a high and they're constantly chasing that high. But the most high is the high that they're looking for, that everyone has a hole in their heart that needs to be filled by the most high. And as I begin, as I begin to show them these principles and begin to show them my life, how I was once in darkness at a, at a young age and how God has transformed me from a seller of dope into a giver of hope, that I'm able to give them hope when they begin to see my life. Mr. Uh, Dozier, you were in the Army, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, you're a Vietnam vet? Yes, sir. No, not a Vietnam vet, sir. No, sir, my dad was a Vietnam vet. Oh, dad was a Vietnam I wasn't even born in Vietnam. I'm, okay. I was born in 1971. Oh, you, were, you were in the United States Army. Did you get yes, an honorable discharge? Yes, sir. Where, how long were you in the Army? I was in the army two years, sir. Now you're a mentor for the reentry court program. Yes, sir. Tell me about that. Yes, uh, thanks for asking, sir. Uh, I think that, that the reentry re program is the greatest program on the planet, and the reason why I say that because uh, the mentors that I work with are uh, the, what you would call the cream of the crop here in Angola. It's handpicked guys that have uh, uh, most of them. Are, are Bible college graduates or pastors. And, and, and they have to be uh, these type of guys because we're dealing with uh, young men's lives. And we want to mold these young men's lives because I have two grandkids and we want to have these guys ready to go and be around our grandkids and be a positive influence. And we get some guys that are rough around the edges. I've been a social mentor for 12 years here in Angola and we seen hundreds of guys and we've seen hundreds of success stories that guys are doing extremely well and are, are have broken the addiction cycle and broken the generational curses that they were bound by. And they're out there living our standing lives and living for God now. Dojo, I noticed that you're involved in something called Tyro Leadership. Explain that to me, what is that? Yeah, sure, that, that's a class taught by the Torino family. Uh, the Torino family, uh, was he was an ex-con, but he's out there doing things that I would like to do, and he's going around around the nation uh, representing God, and he's teaching men how to be leaders, and teaching men how to own up and man up into uh, the things that that they need to be doing, and being people of purpose. He, he teaches us how to be men with missions, you know, and to stand firm in the in the things that are, are right. Talk a little bit about your disciplinary record. You've had seven write-ups since you've been there. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, which is an excellent record. Your last one was in 2015. What was that for? Do you remember? Yes, sir. Thanks for asking, sir. Uh, I definitely do remember. Uh, in 2015, I had uh, a TB test. 
And in that TB test, uh, uh, well, this is what it is. We, we get a, a, a prick on our arm on a Wednesday and we have to come back Friday uh, to get it checked. And being with the mentees, I forgot, my fault forgot. And uh, I get, did not get my uh, TB uh, test checked. And I got wrote up for that, sir. Tell me what your transition plan, if you were to get positive votes today to release you, uh, where would you be going? Thanks for asking, sir. Uh, one of the other greatest uh, uh, programs on the planet, I would have to say, would, would be the Parole Project, which has an extremely success level. Uh, I would be met at the gates uh, by Andrew Huntley and Kerry Myers, a uh, wonderful organization, and I would uh, be able to be uh, transitioned uh, by them. And after the Parole Project, I'm also connected to Norris Henderson Vote. Uh, and I'm also, I also have my wonderful family that's here, my 30-year-old son that's a business owner uh, in, the, in the Alexandria area. Uh, and I have my wonderful fiance of 12 years. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner. My wonderful mother that's a minister of the gospel and my sister's here to help me transition. And I would be living with my mother uh, um, in Alexandria and uh, working for my son. Is that those your enterprises that you had listed? That's your son? Yes, sir. Mr. Dozier, what what would you say if you had an opportunity to say something to the family? Of, yes, sir. Uh, for, uh, yes. Uh, that I'm extremely remorseful for the harming. Uh, and the death of Mr. Clarence Roban, and for the pain that I've caused the, the, not only the family, but the friends of the family. And I'm deeply remorseful uh, for what I've done. And, and I pray that they would be uh, see the change in me and, and see who God has allowed me to be. And I, I, I regret it. It is not a, a day in my life that I don't. Uh, see what I've done and uh, I, I've hurt and changed people's lives, you know, and, and shattered lives. I, I, I know that and I'm, and I'm extremely remorseful. That I, and I just, I just pray, you know, that, that, that my life can be seen and Forgiveness could take place, and, and I'm just trusting God just to just to comfort the family, and I just pray that um, everything that um, that the that the pain that I've caused that that God would comfort them and and strengthen us all. Mr. Dozier, in reviewing your file, I, I note that you've got a lot of letters of support from a lot of prison staff over the years that you've worked with. Uh, you also have uh, opposition from law enforcement. Uh, there's nothing you can do about that, but uh, they are vehemently opposed to your release. Uh, certainly, the victim's family is vehemently opposed to your release. There's nothing you can do about that. It, it is what it is, and I want to put that on the record. Uh, your risk assessment is low. Uh, you have one child, is that correct? How old is you? Is that your son? Yes, he's 30 years old. 30 years old, and you have a good relationship with him, I assume? Awesome relationship with him. One, what can you tell us about Mr. Dozier? Um, I can tell you that Mr. Dozier is one of the social mentors in reentry court. And to be a social mentor, two of the classes that y'all um, mentioned, Tyro Leadership is one of the uh, prerequisites. And also we have this new one, Trauma and Healing. healing. Um, the role of the social mentor is to mentor the mentees into knowing uh, life skills. So when they get out as a, um, as a free citizen, they would know how to use their social skills to 
keep a job because you can always get all kinds of trades when you get the job it's the social skills that you need to uh to be able to keep the job so he's been real real good and, and instrumental in playing a part in our rancher court uh program um other than that i can tell you that he's uh, exemplified uh rehabilitation skills and stuff and uh he has been a model inmate thank you very much it's one quick yes. Uh, good morning, Mr. Doji again. How are you? I'm fine, Mr. Roche. Now, your understanding your transition plan put you in Alexandria, Louisiana, that vicinity, right? Yes, sir. And how far is your residence from the place where you committed the crime? I think it's about 30 miles, sir. It's about 30 miles away. Yes, sir. Have you given thought to any other transition plan? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my wife stays in Baton Rouge. Uh, fiance, we, if the opportunity that is allotted, we'll be getting married in, in May if the opportunity is allotted. Have you ever given any thought to uh, setting up in Baton Rouge instead of Alexandria? Yes, sir. I would like to see you if and when you're released. Get out of the vicinity in which the victims family live. Simply because it is a a, a, a emotional, physical, and mental stress on that family if and when they're ever released. And I think some consideration should be given to putting at least 100, 100 200 miles between you and that victim's family. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from your supporters, uh, Mr. Kerry Myers. Um, yes, good morning. Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Here to let the board know that Mr. Dozier is our client. We've been working with Mr. Dozier all the way through his clemency process uh, for more than, than two years now. Um, and uh, we have uh, all the confidence in the world that Mr. Dozier is exactly who you see here, a very mature man. Um, a man who has given back to his community, um, a man who has a, 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 an amazing support system, um, regardless of whether he'd be in Baton Rouge or Alexandria. Parole Project is prepared to support him uh, through his transition. And if it takes a little bit longer uh, to make that transition to Baton Rouge, we're prepared to do that. Uh, we certainly, like, as I said, believe in, believe in Mr. Dozier and in his uh, capacity to, to to be a, a, an excellent member of his community. Uh, so we'd ask this board to grant his parole today. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, now we'll hear from uh, the opposition, uh, Mr. Brian Greenwood. Good morning, Mr. Greenwood. If you would give us your full name and tell us what you'd like us to hear. Was the last uh, tell us what you'd like us to hear. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Greenwood. I'm the grandson of Clarence Roban. And today I would like to provide you with a little bit of additional information uh, based on our. Uh, I'm going to start with the fact of the word word, W O R D. The word word mean, I'm not going to go into the meaning, however, words have meaning. And in meaning, they can be positive or they can be negative. People mean things, say things, but at times, you don't see the action. I heard a few things today that disturbed me, of course, because my, the victim is my friend. But in a word, there are contracts, there are covenants, there are agreements. There are promises of things that people say. 
Mr. Dozier mentioned something of the fact that somebody owed him. And because of the decision that he made, unintended consequences occurred. I want to tell you a little story about the same thing on our side of the world, which my mother, her sister, during the sentencing phase, said that the choices were presented to them as follows. The death penalty or life without parole. Things happen. They chose the opportunity of life without parole because of the values that they have. Words, unintended consequences have occurred because it was to them. And the reason why I'm here and not because she is deceased is the fact that words of the unintended consequences of them giving life and not pursuing the death penalty, we're here today as unintended consequences on our side of conversation. I want to make it known that that is what the decision of our family made at that time. I want to talk about my grandfather, real quickly. The values of hard work are instilled in myself, my brother, and my family. I learned how to work when I was 12 years old on his farm. And the impact that he had on not only myself and my cousins and the family, but the whole community of a whole. Because you see, he provided education to everyone regarding agriculture. And he valued the value of education. And today, I, I use a lot of the things that I learned through him. Last week would have been his 110th birthday. His death date, I purposely made my wedding date because I want to never forget that day. It was far me. I want to talk about the resident, should this occur. I hope it doesn't. You have a very hard job to do. I know you. But the facts are these. We have a large. And to, and to your point, sir, appreciate your comments. Because we have family almost in every corner of Louisiana. And to say that 30 miles from where the murder occurred is not acceptable. And so that's close talk to you. And looking at other places inside of Louisiana, an hour and a half drive, two hour drive, there's a, you, draw, you draw a circle around that accident, we have family. So I don't know how that resident plan is going to work. Should you decide going in that direction, which hope you consider opposite of that. The last thing is, is that it's hard to see on our side the facts of words because we committed through our, our my mother, her sisters, about doing what was right and what they felt at that time because they were life giving. They were all in education. They educated everyone in their classes. It's hard to see outside of words to which we have seen the action of the public. The final thing I'll say is this, unintended consequences. There were four of them in one of my, four, four young folks, probably less than 30, less than 20, I don't know, I don't in an 82 year old, Four against one. That's, that's absurd to say that. And if there were a problem and they were to just ask and say, excuse me, sir, could I borrow $20? My grandfather would have given them $20 right there to be done. That's the type of person. This is a hard decision. I'm going to tell you, I can only do what I can do. I appreciate the responsibility that 
and the weight on your shoulder, but I would hope that you would take into consideration the things that we have sent you to review on our side and the things that I say, and my cousins are about to say, in the consideration that this may not be the right decision about letting someone go based on crime that was unintended. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Ms. Nell Wilson Albrecht. My mother was originally supposed to enter the healing well this morning from reading of a version of her statement. My name is Nell. My mother is Claire Rodan Wilson, who is the daughter of Clarence Rodan, who you know was murdered in his home by Mormon Dover. Along with my family, I appear to oppose this girl. My grandfather was a good man. He served his daughters and his community. In his whole family, his death affected us all and left his daughters frightened and sick. My grandfather was beaten to death in the course of a home invasion and armed robbery planned and perpetrated by Monty. There was no compassion, there was no provocation. Papa did not or could not resist or defend himself. Uh, the, the, his defensive wing showed that he did try to shield his head from the blows. He was in his 80s, crippled from a bad hip, and weighed less than 150 pounds. The only testimony provided about the manner of Papa's murder was provided by the, you know, the girl his murderers used as bait to do intensive visits. He testified earlier that day she had stolen money from my friend. When she later purchased drugs from Dozier and told him of her theft, he planned to go back to my grandfather's house and rob her to admit he was not a lead in these drugs from his decision in this act. Concerned that he lacked the courage to kill an old man, she was admitted, he recruited a man who was confident was capable of committing a murder. Make no mistake, when these men left to go to my grandfather's home, they did so with premeditated and cold-blooded attempt to murder him. When Dozier and his associates arrived at the house, they went upstairs to look for Dozier and his associate Davenport overpowered my grandfather in his back. They entered his home armed with a tire iron and beat my grandfather, crushing his skull and leaving him to die in his back. We believe they planned to kill Papa, whether they got any money or not. The murder of my grandfather was a cruel and brutal act, bringing no human decency or regard for the life of a man they had never met who had done them no wrong. Based on Vicki Coco's testimony, she was the bait, Bracken was the driver, Davenport was the hitman, and Norman Dozier was the planner, the organizer, and the leader of this band. So his guilt is embraced. Dozier was found guilty of second degree murder by 12 jurors who believed that life in prison without parole was the appropriate sentence for this. A distinguished district court judge imposed this sentence, agreeing with the jury. Three judges of the Third Circuit, Third Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals unanimously affirmed the conviction of innocence. That means 16 people, including four judges, agreed that Dozier was guilty of a brutal and premeditated murder and should be penalized for that crime by life in prison without parole. As I said, this is not a spur of the moment, heated passion, or emotionally charged. People. It was a cold blooded, pre planned, and in our opinion, intentional execution. These men, led by Norman Dozier, Calmly, coolly, and without provocation, beat an 83-year-old death. This was a barbaric act. Now he is asking for mercy and compassion he never showed my grandfather. He talked about his work in recovery, his work dealing with trauma, and the influences of people on his behavior. But prior to being considered for commutation of his sentence, and prior to this parole hearing, he did not avail himself of opportunities to take accountability to himself and to my family for what he had done. 
prison is intended as a punishment, which in this case is well deserved. But it also serves to keep people like Georgia away from us and other innocent citizens. Cousin Missy reminds us that the best foreteller of the future is history. And history tells us that Norman Dozier could murder when convenience or greed requires it. Because he showed no regard for human life or human decency. If Norman Dozier gets out of prison and finds himself in a similar circumstance, we believe that he will kill again, just as he did. I understand that Norman Dozier has a family who want him home. I'm sorry that they have had to go through this. But my family believes that Norman Dozier is a cold blooded murderer and needs to stay right where he is for the rest of his life. We respectfully ask that the board that the board deny his Thank you very much, ma'am. Now we get from this uh, Robin Moore. Morning. Um, I'm Robin Moore. I'm the grandson of Clarence Schulman. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, I'm the eldest of the grandchildren, and uh, he was a role model to me. Uh, it, it kind of begins with his story. And his story is a young boy coming up in a large family, and uh, the only one of eight uh, that goes to college with a scholarship. Um, graduates from LSU with honors, goes to a boss parish, and becomes an agriculture teacher. Marries his wife, Emma, which is a teacher also. She's a teacher also. Uh, they teach in Hesmer and they raise a family of four girls. They educate those girls who all become teachers. And uh, he has a Im big impact on their lives. Also in his community, he has a big impact. Nobody talked about his church today, his Catholic church, that in 1959, he was on the building committee to build a new church at San Alfonso in Essen. I'm inspired by him because I became an ag teacher also. I retired after 32 and a half years of teaching ag, and I'm very blessed to have had him as a mentor. Um, I'm the young man that found him sitting on that commode, having been hit by a tire tool. I'm the young man that testified in the four trials that went on and was devastated by his loss. See, because I had lost my wife two years before that with breast cancer, and she had left me with two young kids. This was a sad way to take away his life. It was a cowardly way to take his life. He had done so much for us and for the community and the people all around us that I hated to see the way he uh, died. My parents, along with my aunts and my uncles talked a lot about this and what went on. And as the trials occurred, my mother and her sisters asked for life in prison instead of a death penalty. We thought life in prison meant for life. Today we're finding out that maybe something different. And back at that point in time, I told them, you bet, better be very cautious of what you allow to happen. But because of the kind of people they were, because of the kind of compassion they had, and the kind of compassionate person he was, they said, we'll go with the light in prison since. So I, I want to say today that I respect the job that you do up there, and I hope uh, that you would continue to uh, keep Mr. Doja incarcerated, uh, I know he's done rehabilitation and done all kinds of things. We all make mistakes. And we have to pay for our mistakes. And we thought it was so we're going to get life in prison. So I thank you for your time and your effort. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you very much, Mr. Moro. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Dozier, is there anything you'd like to say uh, before we vote? Yes, sir. That I'm deeply remorseful for the harming and the death of Mr. Clarence Roban and for the pain that I caused the family and, and friends. And that it was deep remorse that compelled me to spend every awakening moment of my life allowing God uh, to work on me from the inside out that I might become a per person of purpose, that I'm not that selfish, inconsiderate, immature 24-year-old that was a part of the problem, that I have become a, a selfless, considerate, mature man of God that's a part of the solution. And if given the opportunity uh, to make parole, I would make this honorable board, my wonderful family, and my community very, very proud. Thank you very much and God bless you. Hi. Right. Mr. Dozier, uh, ladies and gentlemen present today, uh, I do appreciate the courage that it's taken for you to come here and talk with us. And uh, I hear your pain. I, I don't can't say that I, I, I can really understand it. I, 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 I feel your pain. I know what you've gone through. Uh, we all have different roles in the criminal justice system. Law enforcement has a particular role. Defense lawyers, prosecutors have a particular role. The judge has a particular role. Legislature has a particular role. And the pardon board, the parole board has a particular role. And while we are to consider the horrible facts of this case, the crime that this man has committed, this court's, this board's responsibility and obligation is to look and see who he is today, Harrison, in light of all of the factors that we take into account. And in looking at Mr. Dozier and the things that he's been able to accomplish in the last 27 years in prison, uh, he has a good disciplinary record. He's got excellent uh, comments by the warden, by uh, prison staff of the things that he's been able to accomplish while he's been there. He is a mentor to other prisoners uh, in prison. Uh, he has established a program that uh, helps prisoners there. He's done a lot of community service work while he's been there. He's got an excellent transition plan. Uh, the things that this board needs to look at to determine whether or not he has earned through his work in prison uh, a chance at parole. Having looked at all of those factors, my vote today would be to grant his parole to the Louisiana Parole Project, with the condition that he had no contact whatsoever with the victims, to get a substance abuse evaluation or whatever treatment is recommended, six hours of community service work per month, uh, and that he be on a curfew from, six, from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, daily. That would be my vote. I'm only one of three votes. Uh, Ms. Jackson? I'm really torn. These cases are only gone. They're only gone. I was a criminal court judge for 28 years. I've only been on this board since 2000. But I can tell you that the decisions that I've had to make on this board are more difficult than any decision that I've ever had to make as a judge. And we had to impose a pronouncement of a death sentence on someone. So I don't take this process lightly at all. To know that this is a hard day for the families, it always is. But in previously, this board reviewed Mr. Doe's case and made a recommendation to the governor that 
you will see the communication that request went to the governor's office, the governor and the staff uh, reviewed it very carefully. And, and they don't always accept this board recommendation. There have been times when the governor had declined to uh, grant a commutation. But in this case, the governor and the staff came to the conclusion that Mr. Dozier had demonstrated enough by his actions over the last 27 years, they believe that he was a suitable candidate for computation. And so I was on um, the panel that recommended computation. And there is nothing that's happened in the interim that would change the position the board took when Mr. Dozier first appeared for his computation. So based on uh, the work Mr. Dozier has done over the last 27 plus years, the positive comments from prison and the service that he's rendered to others, my vote likewise would be to the uh, world. Motion. Second. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dozier. Yes, sir. I sat on your pardon hearing, and as an old man, I don't remember exactly how I voted. But today, the overwhelming expressed opposition from the victim's family, and as Mr. Bradbrow has said, each and every one of us have a different function. And I, I have a different function on this board. I am the victim's advocate. I am the person who keeps the victim in the process. And the victim plays a very, very important part in this process. And the victim's family plays an even more important part of this process. And I have an obligation when I see this much express opposition from the DA's office, from law enforcement, and from the victim's family, the nature of the crime that was committed only 27 years ago, my vote is to deny your request this morning. Thank you. Two out of three. Two votes out of three. Which, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Dozier, uh, you have received the two of three votes to uh, grant your parole uh, under our rules and guidelines. Uh, your parole has been granted today. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Lord God. <laughs> Sure. I am Mel Wilson's father, and these are all my nieces. It appears to me, what you're going to do, you're going to do when you got here. No, why why no, put my family through all this? If you're already doing it? Well, that 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 is, is not accurate, sir. We do review these files before we prepare them in advance, but we often come in here. Uh, believing one thing when we read reports and we change our mind when we hear people. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. certainly are prepared. Thank we you certainly didn't time. come in here with uh, frequency. We notes. appreciate your time. Very much. Thank you.